Chapter Twenty Four of Master of the Vineyard by Myrtle Reed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Minister's Call. Rosemary, Grandmother called imperiously, but there was no answer. Rosemary, she cried shrilly. She ain't here, Ma," said Matilda. "I reckon she's gone out somewheres." Did you ever see the beat of it? She's getting high and mighty all of a sudden this makes twice lately that she's gone out without even tellin us let alone askin whether she could go or not just wait till she comes back matilda laughed in her most aggravating manner i reckon we'll have to wait she retorted as long as we don't know where she's gone and when she's comin back just wait repeated grandmother ominously i'll tell her a thing or two you just see if i don't the fires of her wrath smouldered dully ready to blaze forth at any moment matilda waited with the same sort of pleasurable excitement which impels a child to wait under the open window of a house in which there is good reason to believe that an erring playmate is about to receive punishment what's she been doin all day grandmother demanded nothing more than usual i guess matilda replied she did up the work this morning and got dinner and washed the dishes and went to the store and when she come back she was up in the attic for a spell and then she went out without saying where she was goin in the attic what was she doin in the attic i don't know i'm sure she's got no call to go to the attic if i want her to go up there i'll tell her so this is my house yes returned matilda with a sigh i've heard tell that it was hum grunted grandmother for an hour or more there was silence not peaceful but tense for grandmother was thinking of things she might say to the wayward rosemary then the culprit came in cheerfully singing to herself and unmindful of impending judgment rosemary yes grandmother what is it come here rosemary obeyed readily enough though she detected warlike possibilities in the tone set down i've got something to say to you i have something to say to you too grandmother rosemary replied taking the chair indicated by the shaking forefinger for the first time in her life she was not afraid of the old lady i've noticed grandmother began tremulously that you're getting high and mighty all of a sudden you've gone out twice lately without askin if you might go and i won't have it do you understand i hear you the girl answered is that all no tain't all you don't seem to have any sense of your position here you are a poor orphan beholden to your grandmother for every mouthful you eat and all the clothes you wear and if you can't behave yourself better an you've been doin you shan't stay a faint smile appeared around the corners of rosemary's mouth then vanished very well grandmother she answered demurely rising from her chair i'll go whenever you want me to shall i go now set down commanded the old lady i'd like to know where you'd go i'd go to mrs marsh's i think she'd take me in you've got another think coming then grandmother sneered didn't i tell you to set down yes returned rosemary coolly but i'm not going to i said i had something to say to you i'm going to be married next week to alden marsh i've taken enough of the money my father left me to buy a white dress and a new hat and the storekeeper has sent to the city for me for some white shoes and stockings i'm going to have some pretty underwear too and a grey travelling dress i've just come from the dressmaker's now money screamed the old lady so that's what you've been doin in the attic you're a thief that's what you are your mother was stop said rosemary her voice was low and controlled but her face was very white not another word against my mother you've slandered her for the last time i am not a poor orphan beholden to my grandmother for the food i eat and the clothes i wear on the contrary you and aunt matilda are dependent upon me and have been for a good many years i have father's letter here do you care to read it 
shaken from head to foot the old lady sank into her chair she was speechless but her eyes blazed matilda sat by the window dumb with astonishment this was not at all what she had expected rosemary had drawn a yellow old letter from the recesses of her brown gingham gown and was offering it to grandmother the sight of it had affected the old lady powerfully very well rosemary was saying as she returned the letter to its hiding-place in case you've forgotten i'll tell you what's in it the day father sailed up the coast he sent you a draft for more than eleven thousand dollars he said it was for me for my clothes and my education in case anything happened to him he said that you were to give me whatever i might want or need as long as the money lasted i'll leave it to you whether you've carried out his instructions or not now that i'm going to be married i've taken the liberty of helping myself to a small part of what is my own there's almost two thousand dollars left and you're quite welcome to it but i won't be married in brown gingham nor go to my husband in ragged shoes and if i think of anything else i want i'm going to have it ma said matilda tremulously if this is so we ain't done right by rosemary it's so rosemary continued turning toward the figure at the window you can read the letter if you want to she put her hand to her breast again but matilda shook her head if you want me to go the girl went on i'll go now mrs marsh will take me in but i'll have to explain why i ask it i haven't told alden or his mother and i don't want to i won't bring shame upon those of my own blood if i can help it but what i've had i've earned and i don't feel indebted to you for anything not even a single slice of bread that's all grandmother staggered to her feet breathing heavily her face was colourless her lips ashen grey rosemary star she said with long pauses between the words i'll never speak to you again as long as i live then she fell back into her chair with her hand upon her heart very well grandmother rosemary returned shrugging her shoulders you'll have to do as you like about that by supper-time the household was calm again upon the surface true to her word grandmother refused to communicate directly with rosemary she treated the girl as if she might a piece of furniture unworthy of attention except in times of actual use she conveyed her wishes through matilda as a sort of human telephone matilda she would say will you ask rosemary to fill the teapot with hot water and again matilda will you tell rosemary to put out the milk pitcher and to lock the back door it was not necessary however for matilda to tell rosemary the girl accepted the requests as though they had been given directly with her head held high and the faintest shadow of an ironical smile upon her face after supper while rosemary was washing the dishes grandmother took the lamp she was half way to the door when matilda inquired where are you going ma i'm going up to my room to set and read a spell but but the lamp i need it to read by grandmother announced with considerable asperity and you don't need to hunt around for no more lamps neither i've got em all put away but matilda objected me and rosemary you and rosemary humph you can set in the dark or anywhere else you please with that she slammed the door and was gone rosemary came in after a little humming to herself with an assumed cheerfulness she was far from feeling then she went out into the kitchen and came back with a match the feeble flicker of it revealed only aunt matilda and no lamp where's grandmother asked rosemary in astonishment and what has become of the lamp she's gone up to her room and she's took the lamp with her matilda laughed hysterically rosemary brought in the candle from the kitchen as it happened it was the last candle and was nearly gone but it would burn for an hour or two i'm sorry aunt matilda said rosemary kindly if you want to read or anything i don't she interrupted i'd like to sit and talk a spell i don't know as we need the candle if she should happen to come back she'd be mad she said she'd put away the lamps and i reckon she'd have took the candle too if she'd thought very well answered rosemary blowing out the candle 
i'm not afraid of the dark moreover it was not the general policy of the household to ruffle grandmother's temper unnecessarily rosemary said aunt matilda a little later ma's a hard woman she always has been yes the girl agreed listlessly i ain't never said much but i've had my own troubles i've tried to bear em patiently but sometimes i ain't been patient she's always made me feel so ugly rosemary said nothing but she felt a strange softening of her heart toward aunt matilda i don't know as you'll believe me the older woman went on after a pause but i never knew nothing about that money i know you didn't aunt matilda it's behind a loose brick in the chimney in the attic on the right-hand side you have to stand on a chair to reach it if you want any of it go and help yourself it's mine and you're welcome to it as far as i'm concerned i don't know what i'd want returned matilda gloomily i ain't never had nothin and i've sort of got out of the habit i did use to think that if it ever come my way i'd like a white straw hat with red roses on it but i'm too old for it now tears of pity filled rosemary's eyes and a lump rose in her throat aunt matilda's deprivations had been as many as her own and had extended over a much longer period the way of escape was open for rosemary but the older woman must go on hopelessly until the end it was sixteen years ago to-night said aunt matilda dreamily that the minister come to call was it asked rosemary she did not know what else to say i thought maybe you'd remember it but i guess you was too little you was only nine and you used to go to bed at half past seven it was five minutes of eight when he come was it asked rosemary again yes don't you remember hearin the door-bell ring no i must have been asleep children go to sleep awful quick it was five minutes of eight when he come were you expecting him no i wasn't he'd said to me once on the way out of church after sunday school miss matilda i must be comin over to see you some one of these pleasant evenings with your kind permission just like that he says with your kind permission i was so flustered i couldn't say much but i did manage to tell him that ma and me would be pleased to see him any time and what do you suppose he said i don't know answered rosemary he said it's you i'm comin to see not your ma just like that it's you her voice had a new note in it a strange thrill of tenderness and so she went on after a pause he come i was wearin my brown alpaca that i just finished i tried it on after supper to see if it was all right and it was so i kept on wearin it though ma was tellin me all the time to take it off her and me had just cleaned the parlor that day it couldn't have happened better and when the bell rang i went to the door myself were you surprised my land yes i'd thought maybe he'd come but not without tellin me when or askin for permission as he'd said he come in and took off his hat just like he was expected and he shook hands with ma and me he only said how do you do miss star to her but to me he says i'm glad to see you miss matilda how well you're looking yes just like that we went and sat down in the parlor i'd cleaned the lamp that day too it was the same lamp moss took upstairs with her now it was on the centre table by the basket of wax flowers under the glass shade they was almost new then and none of em was broken they looked awful pretty ma came in the parlor too and she sat down between him and me and she says i've been wantin to ask you something ever since i heard your last sermon three weeks ago come sunday i ain't been to church since and i can't feel like i ought to go i'm sorry he says just as gentle if you have any doubts that i can clear up he says about the scripture tain't the scripture i'm doubtin says ma it's you that isn't as bad he says smilin but i could see he was scared you know how ma is especially when you ain't used to her i'd like to ask says ma whether you believe that unbaptized infants is goin to be saved 
why yes he says i do i suspicioned it ma says oh her voice was awful may i ask you just what grounds you have for believing such a thing i don't know as i could tell you just what grounds i have he says but i certainly feel that the god i humbly try to serve is not only just but merciful and if there's anything on earth purer or more like a flower than a little baby he says i don't know what it is whether it's been baptized or not i don't think god cares so much about forms and ceremonies as he does about people's hearts them's the very words he said well resumed matilda after a pause ma was bent on arguin with him about that and baptism by a sprinklin or by immersion and about the lost tribes of israel and goodness knows what else he didn't want to argue and was all the time tryin to change the subject but it was no use i never got a chance to say a dozen words to him and finally when he got up to go he says i've had a very pleasant evenin and i'd like to come again some time soon if i may he says just like that and before i could say a word ma had said i don't know as we feel ourselves in need of your particular brand of theology she says it's my opinion that you ought to be up before the trustees instead of around callin on faithful members of the church sowin the seeds of doubt in their minds his face turned bright red but he shook hands with ma very polite and with me i've always thought he squeezed my hand a little and he says to me very pleasant good night miss matilda but that was all for ma went to the door with him and banged it shut before he'd got down the steps the day before he went away i met him in the post office accidental and he says miss matilda i've got something for you if you'll accept it and he took me over to one side where there couldn't nobody see us and he gave me his tintype and he says i hope you'll always remember me miss matilda you'll promise not to forget me won't you and i promised she resumed and i ain't i've always remembered there was a long silence then miss matilda cleared her throat light the candle rosemary will you when the tiny flame appeared rosemary saw that the older woman's face was wet with unaccustomed tears she reached down into the bosom of her dress and drew out a small packet which she removed carefully from its many wrappings see she said rosemary leaned over to look at the pictured face the heavy beard did not wholly conceal the sensitive boyish mouth and even the crude art had faithfully portrayed the dreamy boyish eyes i want to ask you something aunt matilda said as she wrapped it up again you're going to be married yourself now and you'll know about such things do you think if it hadn't been for ma it might have been anything rosemary put out the light i'm sure it would she said kindly oh rosemary breathed the other with a quick indrawing of the breath are you truly sure truly said rosemary very softly then she added convincingly you know alden's never been to see me but once and i haven't even a tintype of him and yet we're going to be married that's so i hadn't thought of that i guess you're right then she added generously i'm glad you're going to be married rosemary and i hope you'll be happy you've got it comin to you thank you said rosemary choking a little on the words thank you dear aunt matilda then some way in the dark their arms found each other and their lips met end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of master of the vineyard by myrtle reed this librivox recording is in the public domain a wedding the air was crystalline and cool yet soft and full of a mysterious spicy fragrance blue skies arched down at the vast curve of the horizon to meet a bluer sea snowy gulls swept lazily through the clear blue spaces their hoarse crying softened into a weird music upon the dazzling reaches of white sand rosemary was walking with alden he had his arm around her and her face was turned toward his 
he was radiant with youth and the joy of living it was in the spring of his step upon the sand the strong muscular lines of his body and more than all in his face in his eyes were the strange sweet fires that rosemary had seen the day she was hidden in the thicket and saw him holding edith in his arms but it was all for her now for rosemary and the past was as dead as though it had never been as they walked they talked saying to each other the thousand dear and foolish things that lovers have said since back in the garden the first woman looked into the eyes of the first man and knew that god had made her to be his mate suddenly a white cliff loomed up on the beach before them and from its depths came a tremendous knocking as though some one were endeavouring to escape from a hopeless fastness of stone they paused but the knocking continued growing louder and louder then a hoarse voice called rosemary rosemary the girl came to herself with a start rubbing her eyes gaunt and grey in the first dim light of morning aunt matilda stood over her clad in a nondescript dressing-gown rosemary she whispered shrilly come quick ma's had a stroke they ran back to the old lady's room in the girl's confused remembrance the narrow hallway seemed to be a continuation of the white sunlit beach with the blue sky and sea changed to faded wallpaper and the cliff gone grandmother lay upon her bed helpless uttering harsh guttural sounds that seemingly bore no relation to speech her eyes blazed at the sight of rosemary and she tried to sit up in bed but could not when asked rosemary just now aunt matilda answered i was asleep and when i woke up i heard her she must have woke me up what shall we do she continued helplessly after a pause i don't know rosemary whispered almost stunned by the shock i'll dress and go for the doctor in an hour she had returned with the physician who felt the old lady's pulse and shook his head in the hall he interviewed the other two has she had any shock he asked for a moment there was no answer then matilda answered clearly no no echoed rosemary no unusual excitement of any sort or no bad news not that i know of matilda replied calmly nothing unusual rosemary assured him extraordinary he murmured i'll be in again this afternoon when he had gone aunt matilda turned anxiously to rosemary do you think we did right shouldn't we have told him i don't know what difference it could make rosemary replied thoughtfully i'd hate to have anybody know what she's done maybe it's my fault she went on sadly perhaps i shouldn't have told her don't go blaming yourself rosemary i don't know why you shouldn't have told her if i'd been you i'd have told her long ago or had you just found it out i've known for quite a while i don't think i'd have said anything though if i wasn't going to be married it didn't seem as if i could be married in brown gingham when father meant for me to have everything i wanted and the money was there don't worry about it for a minute said aunt matilda kindly you've done just right and you ain't to blame for what's happened it's her own fault rosemary prepared a breakfast tray and matilda took it up it's better for you to stay away rosemary she said for we don't want her to get excited when she returned she reported that the old lady had with evident difficulty eaten a little oatmeal and choked down a cup of coffee she was calmer but unable to speak the unaccustomed silence of the house affected them both strangely grandmother might be upstairs and helpless but the powerful impress of her personality still lingered in the rooms below her red and black plaid shawl hanging from the back of her chair conveyed a subtle restraint the chair itself seemed as though she had just left it and was likely to return to it at any moment when the doctor came again in the afternoon matilda went upstairs with him while rosemary waited anxiously in the dining-room it seemed a long time until they came back and held a brief whispered conference at the front door when he finally went out matilda came into the dining-room literally tense with excitement he says she began sinking into a chair that he don't know i like it in him myself for a doctor that'll admit he don't know when he don't instead of leaving you to find out by painful experience is not only scarce but he's to be trusted when you come across him he says she may get better and she may not 
that in a little while she may be up and movin around and talkin again about the same as she always did and again she may stay just like she is or get worse he said he'd do what he could but he couldn't promise anything that only time would tell if she stays like this she's got to be took care of just the same as if she was a baby fed and turned over and bathed and if she gets better she can help herself some seems funny don't it yesterday she was rampagin around and layin down the law to you and today she can't say yes or no she said yesterday rosemary returned that she'd never speak to me again as long as she lived i wonder if it's true i wonder echoed matilda i'd forgotten that i hadn't said the girl with a grim smile seems almost as if it might be a judgment on her matilda observed after a pause she said she'd never speak to you again and she may never speak to anybody any more and i've got to take care of her that's the trouble with judgments they never hit just the person they were meant to hit we're all so mixed up that somebody else has to be dragged into it plainly before rosemary there opened the way of sacrifice and denial for a moment she hesitated then offered up her joy on the altar of duty i won't be married aunt matilda she said bravely though her mouth quivered i'll stay and help you what i said i wouldn't be married i'll i'll tell alden i can't i'll stay and help you you won't i won't have you speak of such a thing let alone doing it you can't help it if i make up my mind yes i can i'll go and see mrs marsh and him and the minister and the doctor and everybody i'll tell em all everything you go right on ahead with your gettin married i ain't goin to have your life spoiled the way mine has been you're young yet and you've got a right to it but but aunt matilda aunt matilda nothin what could you do anyhow she don't want you anywhere as near her and the doctor said she mustn't be excited i could do what i've always done cooking and cleaning and washing and ironing and i could carry things upstairs for you maybe you could rosemary but you ain't goin to you've served out your time don't you worry about me i ain't goin to kill myself i-i wish you'd let me rosemary stammered well i won't and that's the end of it i'll get along some ways the minister used to say that when god gave any of us a burden we couldn't carry by ourselves he'd always send help so if i need help i'll have it i'll enjoy myself too in a way she went on after a little it's going to seem awful peaceful to have the house quiet with no talkin nor argument goin on in it sometimes i've thought that if i could get out of the sound of the human voice for a spell i wouldn't feel so ugly it's wore on me considerable never bein alone except nights or when i went upstairs afternoons and pretended to take a nap lots of times i wasn't lying down at all i was just settin there with the door locked thinkin how nice and quiet it was ma'll get a good rest too while she ain't talkin though it ain't for me to say she's needed it so she continued clearing her throat you go right on ahead with your marrying rosemary bent and kissed the hollow withered cheek i will she said oh dear aunt matilda i wish you hadn't missed it all the older woman's steel-blue eyes softened then filled maybe i've missed it and maybe i ain't she said huskily maybe this life is only a discipline to fit us for something better that's comin anyway if we keep on goin and doin the best we can as we go i believe god will make it right for us later on the morning of rosemary's wedding dawned clear and cool it was autumn and yet the sweetness of summer still lingered in the air scarlet banners trailed upon the maples and golden leaves rained from the birches shimmering as they fell amethystine haze lay upon the valley shot through with silver gleams from the river that murmured toward the sea with the sound of far waters asleep purple lights laid enchantment upon the distant hills where the tapestry maker had stored her threads great skeins of crimson and golden green russet and flaming orange to be woven into the warp and woof of september by some magic of starlight and dawn 
lost rainbows and forgotten sunsets had mysteriously come back to lie for a moment upon hill or river and then to disappear noon had been chosen for the ceremony in the little church at the foot of the hill of the muses for as alden had said with a laugh even though it was private it might as well be fashionable aunt matilda was up at dawn putting new lace into the neck and sleeves of her best brown alpaca as tremulous and anxious as though she herself were to be the bride rosemary had packed her few belongings the day before in the little old-fashioned trunk that had been her mother's as she dressed aunt matilda sat on the bed pathetically eager to help in some way though it might be only to pin up a stray lock or tie a shoe rosemary shook out the dull ashen masses of her hair with a sigh as she put it up alden's big betrothal diamond blazed starlike upon her rough red hand she contemplated it ruefully it seemed so out of place then brightened at the memory of the promise mrs marsh had made so long ago she'll teach me how to take care of my hands said rosemary half to herself so they'll look like hers she repeated aunt matilda who mrs marsh mother yes i guess she will she'll teach you a lot of things ma and me have never heard tell of maybe you just as soon ask her rosemary why she never returned my call i will surely i don't think she meant anything by it aunt matilda she might have been busy and forgotten about it anyhow you'll have to come to see me now yes i will i thought i'd put the minister's tintype up on the mantel now as long as ma ain't likely to see it it'll be company for me and i reckon i'll get me a cat i always wanted one and ma would never let me have it i can keep it downstairs and she may never know about it but even if she hears it meowing or me talking to it she can't say nothing about it my ain't it beautiful she continued as rosemary slipped her white gown over her head please let me hook it up rosemary this is as near as i'll ever come to a wedding are you going in to see her before you go rosemary hesitated yes she sighed i'll go i think i ought to don't if you don't want to i wouldn't spoil my wedding day by doing anything i didn't like to do i want to murmured rosemary i wouldn't feel right not to so when she was ready she went into the old lady's room happiness made her almost lovely as she stood there in her simple white gown and big plumed hat drawing long white kid gloves over her red hands grandmother she said tremulously i'm going up to the church now to be married to alden marsh before i go i want to tell you i'm sorry if i've ever done anything i shouldn't do and ask you to forgive me for any unhappiness i may ever have caused you i haven't meant to do it and i i believe you've meant to be good to me i hope you're glad i'm going to be happy now the stern old face relaxed ever so little the sharp eyes softened with mist and by tremendous effort grandmother put out a withered wavering hand rosemary bent over the bed lifted her in her strong young arms and kissed her twice then hurried away alden met them as they were halfway to the church and utterly regardless of two or three interested children who happened to be passing shook hands with aunt matilda then bent to kiss the flushed and happy face under the big plumed hat what magnificence he said i'm unworthy of so much splendor i'm afraid how on earth did you manage it rosemary glanced at aunt matilda then laughed a little sadly oh she answered with assumed lightness i just managed it that's all at the door of the church madame welcomed them with an armful of white roses for the bride she too had a new gown in honor of the occasion and her sweet old face was radiant with smiles what a lovely bride she said as she kissed rosemary oh my dear you mustn't truly no tears on a wedding day the minister was waiting at the altar madame and aunt matilda sat down together in a front pew there was a moment's solemn hush then the beautiful service began sunlight streamed through the open windows carrying the color and fragrance of autumn into every nook and cranny of the church from outside came the cheery piping of a robin that had paused upon a convenient window-sill to peep in there was a rush of tiny furred feet through the drifted leaves 
and a gleam of scarlet as a falling maple leaf floated past the open door in the sunlight the taper lights on the altar gleamed like great stars suddenly come to earth that ye may so live together in this life the deep voice was saying and in the life everlasting amen after the benediction came the minister's perfunctory congratulations when he called her mrs marsh rosemary instinctively looked toward madame then laughed and blushed when she understood madame took the girl into her arms as she came down from the altar dear daughter she said truly my daughter now aunt matilda and rosemary hurried back to the little brown house mindful of alden's whispered admonition don't keep me waiting long dear please neither spoke until after rosemary had changed her gown and stood before her mirror in pale lustrous grey with hat and gloves to match i'll go in and say good-bye to grandmother rosemary said wait a minute she may be asleep aunt matilda tiptoed into the old lady's room then came out again with her finger on her lips she's sound asleep she said and her face looks as if she felt better i guess she'll come to herself again all right the stars have always been healthy and hard to kill so the two went downstairs quietly when the door was opened rosemary saw that alden was waiting for her at the gate smiling and with joy thrilling her to the utmost fibre of her being rosemary kissed aunt matilda good-bye then ran out to where her bridegroom was waiting to lead her into the world of service and of love end of chapter twenty five the end of master of the vineyard by myrtle reed recorded by Cillian Major.